All right, so welcome to our CCMP Encore um, class. I um, I want to admit something to you. I have I have been a CCMP for a long time. Um, I honest, don't currently have the CCMP certification because I lost it. I moved it a year and a half ago and I had the flu and didn't wasn't able to actually uh, resert. Um, so I missed my research window. But one of the things that I have been doing is I have been really mentally thinking of this CCMP in Encore as CCMP route. It's not. Um, and what really kind of brought it to my attention, now that's not to say this is an easy test, okay? I don't think it is. I think it's a very difficult test. But I have been thinking of it in terms of the back in the old, anybody in here, anybody in here passed or took CCMP route, the, the actual test back when it was around? Yes. Okay. Well, if, if you did, you remember it had OSPF, OSPF multi area, not so stubby area, stubby, totally stubby, EIGRP, BGP, BGP route reflectors, BGP. I mean, it had, and at one point it even had ISIS on it um, back years. And like I said, I, I had the CCMP for like 18 years. Um, so I have been mentally thinking of this class and exam as CCMP route. Um, it's not. I mean, I actually said, well, let, I'm going to go look very closely at the exam blueprint. So I did put this in the class for you. So it's under your modules, under the very first module. Um, and uh, one of the things I want you to realize is even our book goes into, you know, type four, type five LSAs. Uh, but if you look at what they're asking you to do here in terms of uh, actual OSPF, okay, so let's get down here and find my OSPF section. Um, I may have already missed it. I did. Okay. So here we got uh, troubleshoot static dynamic uh, trunking protocols, MSTP, layer three, compare routing concepts of EIJRP and OSPF. Advanced distance vector versus link state, low balancing, pass selection, metric calculation, those things. So you need to know that you know EIGRP uses bandwidth plus uh, the sum of the delays um, and also the extended EIGRP metrics that are available for faster networks. OSPF uses cost and how to set the, the cost metric and those types of things. But then configure and verify a simple OSPF environment, including multiple normal areas, summarization, and filtering. So in other words, even, you know, the, the labs and the, and everything, not necessarily the labs, but the book talks about type four, type five LSAs. We're really only going to be dealing with type one, type two, and type three LSAs, um, you know, because of the fact we're using just multiple normal areas. We don't have to worry about, if, if you know much about OSPF, there's type seven, there's type, all the way up to 11, there's a gazillion different um, in types of, of LSAs. Um, and mentally, I've kind of been thinking that that's the level we've got to get in OSPF. It's not. Same with EBGP. This is just a directly connected relationship. This is very simple, and it's very common to what we already had in CCNA before they redid the CCNA. Likewise here, you know, a greater depth, but very similar. So um, I do think you need to take some time to look at this particular um, document, dig into it pretty good. Uh, and and be aware of what's going on uh, and 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 kind of um, kind of kind of reset your mind frame uh, if you are a former CCMP um, because I think things are a little bit different on this test. Uh, not to say it's easy, but I think uh, it's probably not to the level that we had expected for like CCMP route. Those topics, the super advanced topics for, for OSPF and BGP have been moved to the ENS, ENARSI exam. Um, so the next one uh, that's, that's available. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, opinions on that. I mean, some of you've looked at this more than me. Basil, I know you've really looked at it close. David, you've looked at it. David's around. I don't know if David's here today or not. Um, David uh, Oliver's looked at it very closely. I've looked at it as well, and there are, there are no EIGRP labs at all in oh. there as well. None whatsoever. And it's just, and you'll notice, and when you look here, it's just compare the concepts. There are no, you don't have to configure it. Now, you do need to configure OSPF. That's one thing I'll also tell you. 
it took me way too many years to have the common sense to see this, but this verb is very important. Mm -hmm. Explain the different principles. So you need to understand basically what these are. You don't have to configure it. Um, analyze. Uh, differentiate, explain, and and, and it, I like I said, I can't believe it took me so many years to actually um, realize this. But I actually had to help write some exams for a company, and when I did, uh, this is the key term here: describe. So we don't have to be able to configure QoS. We need to be able to describe QoS components, what they are. Now down here. We needed to be able to configure VRF. That's why I went over the VRF lab because we got to be able to configure and verify it. We've got to be able to configure GRE and IPsec tunneling. So these are the ones anywhere you see configure or troubleshoot those types of things. You want to do those hands-on labs to make sure you understand how to actually configure it. Otherwise, you need to focus more on understanding the concept, okay? Does that make sense for everybody? Because it, I think it will make life easier for you. It does. Okay, good, good. Now, one of the things that scares me a little bit are these down here, simply because uh, there's so many different ways this could go. Um, but it is, it's part of the book, so we'll go over it um, and it's available. So now I want to give you some good news. I have added the ability to get to google.com. Well, I didn't, my teammate did. I actually asked him to. But you can log into Gmail now. So what I did to give you an example of what I did here is I actually went into um, the documents for the lab and it's not obviously going to let me go to it for some crazy. There it goes. All right. So we're going to look, we're looking at this lab right here, the route summarization lab 913. So I went to this lab, clicked on it. I went down and I selected the pre-configs like this. Well, I'll do it this way. So I selected the pre-configs like this, copied it, opened up Notepad, pasted it in, got rid of the portion of it that's the center portion there that doesn't need to be there, changed my ports. Okay, so make sure you change your ports to be correct and saved it with a name of R1. So I did that. I then emailed those to myself so that I could grab R1's config or R2's config. And now I'm sitting in here, let's request more time. All right. And so I'm sitting in here in this lab. And so I want to configure, I think R1's already configured actually. Let me go ahead and check. Yep, I've already configured R1. So I need to configure R2. So I'm just gonna go into here with the base config. I know most of you know how to do this already, but I want to just show you just to be sure. So now you can actually take those base configs in for your routers and you don't have to spend time typing all this in. Okay, so I can copy it, control C, go back over to CML. Go into global config and then I can just right click and I can paste here. And boom, oop, that one failed. Must have had a, I got a mistake in my, mistake in my, um, yep, yep, I forgot to change my, I forgot to change my, uh, my thing. So let's do this. I can actually fix it right here in mouse pad though. So this should be gig uh, zero, zero. Oops. So I goofed up. And this could be, I forgot to change it before I posted it in here. And then now I can do control A, control C, go back over here, go back into global config, and then paste it. Right click and paste. And boom. So now if I do an exit and I do a show IP int brief, show IP int brief, go can't type. You'll now see that I have the IP addresses and the base config. In fact, if I do a show IP protocols, you should see that OSPF123 is running and it's running for these networks right here. Okay. 
questions about that. So now you can drop those in without having to, um, without having to um, have such a mess. In fact, I've messed this one up too. I'll fix it. You do notice you do you do need to change the uh, do need to change the interfaces before you oops, before you paste it in. And I forgot to do that on my lab, so on my configs. So this will let you do this quickly and and set everything up and save you some time on the lab. Questions about that? I think Google Drive will work too. Um, so you should be able to, anything you can get on Google should work. Now I will warn you, uh, you may get some weird, uh, like some images may not load in Google if it tries to do um, like external sites or something like that. But if you use your Gmail, you shouldn't have any problem at all uh, loading your, your configs in here. That way, if you're not comfortable with paste bin, then you can uh, use your Gmail to get your configs in. You also can save your configs now out to Gmail if you want to do so. So that gives you another option for, uh, for doing that. So here we go. Exit, exit. And then we do it. Oh, I want to do a do. I want to do a do. Show IP and brief. I can't type today, folks. And then show IP OSPF neighbors. You'll see our neighbors here 221, full druther. Okay. Questions about being able to copy those in using uh, Gmail? Any questions at all? All right. The other thing I have done, folks, is I have added all the PowerPoints. So down at the bottom for everyone in the chapters, you'll see our PowerPoints. I'm going to actually use a chapter eight PowerPoint to start um, today to kind of go over um, chapter eight and just discuss it with you. Um, but the PowerPoints as they exist for you will be available once you are an instructor and they are available inside of Netacad at resources, course resources, and right here, enterprise core. You will not have access to this until you pass the class, I don't believe, unless you're a main contact. If you're a main contact at school, you can get it, but otherwise you won't have it. But here's all where I got that from, the instructor PowerPoint. And someone had asked me if there were any PowerPoints available, and that is where you find them. Okay. So, um, Chapter eight, OSPF. Somebody give me the main, well, give me a difference between link state protocols and distance vectors. So let me, let me do this real quick. I'm gonna start up a uh, whiteboard, my whiteboard here. I'm gonna create a new whiteboard. So you notice I was talking about cam tables in my earlier class. Hey, uh, hey Kelly, this is Patrick. Uh, I'll try to, um, th this is kind of how I've described it in previous uh, CCNA classes. Okay. It, um, I look at it sort of like your cell phone has a map application, right? And you go to, let's so say you're, you're mapping to the grocery store um, and you kind of do that where you put the address in, you say go, it kind of gives you that, before you hit go, it kind of gives you that overview of kind of the road you're going to be taking, maybe some, maybe one or two other options right, depending on time and distance, those kind of things, um, versus hitting the go button, and then you're traveling, it says, you know, 0.2 miles, take a left on Main Street, right, Two, five miles, take a right on, you know, whatever street, and I, I kind of look at that, like, for a link state, you're getting all the information, right, you're getting um, a complete picture of that, those directions, right, and that, that's how I kind of say that's like link state OSPF, Turn by turn directions, that's more like distance vector. You're, you're getting whatever that next router is telling you. And so that's kind of like a, a, almost like a step by step direction. Okay. I like that analogy. That's really a good analogy. So complete directions versus just a step by step. Yeah, that, or turn by turn direction. Yeah, exactly. Step or turn. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, one of the things you'll sometimes hear distance vector uh, referred to as is what we call routing by rumor because with distance vector 
um, you only get your directly connected neighbors information. So only directed connected neighbors talk to one another. Um, distance vector traditionally too has, um, it floods the route table typically, floods the table at some interval on some interval. Uh, what's the interval for RIP? Anybody remember? Is it 30 seconds? 30 seconds. It's 30 seconds by default for RIP. Now here's one of the things people don't really know though. Cisco's implementation of RIP also has triggered updates um, because it's not disallowed, but it's not something that you must have. But you'll, that's that confuses people when they look at that. But floods the, the uh, table inter, on some type of interval. You also have, um, you see the network from your neighbor's perspective. That's it. You don't have a, you don't see the neighbor perspective. You don't see a full topology of the network. Now that's not to say that distance vectors are all bad um, because one of the cool things about distance vectors, they usually have a simpler metric. You know, you think about uh, a RIP, the metric is, is just top count. Now, uh, EIGRP is bandwidth plus some of the delays, so it's a little more. But uh, EIGRP is considered an advanced distance vector. It actually has a, really a lot of the link state um, uh, capabilities. With link state, we've got a complete topology view. Okay, so you got a complete topology view. You, um, you flood first, and then you have bounded updates. So then you have triggered updates and bounded updates. Now, what is a triggered update? Somebody tell me what a triggered update is. So basically, it basically it's an update um, based on the event. So there has to be a trigger for it to send out an update, whether it's a um, like a new network or a network went down, but it's an event based driven update. Exactly, so a link down, um, some type of new link being formed, something has to happen in order for a triggered update to occur. So link state actually is pretty efficient in the use of the bandwidth between routers because it doesn't send its entire route table X number of seconds. Um, other things about link state is they typically hold multiple tables. So, um, sorry about that. So typically you will have a topology table Okay, you most of the time have a neighbor table, neighbor table, or neighbor David database, and then you have the route table. So one of the reasons why the we think about link state taking more compute power is because it has to maintain these three tables. It also typically has a uh, a more uh, efficient or more I won't say efficient. Let's not say efficient because I don't think that's the correct word to use. A more complicated or a more, somebody help me out here. I'm talking about metric. What, what is the metric? It's more, uh, I won't say complicated, but let's just say more efficient. Granular, would that be better? What is it? Granular. Yes, that's excellent. Very good. A more granular granular, man, I can't spell that. A more granular method or metric. What is the metric in OSPF? I know it's the overall cost. It's the cost just... of all the links, correct, it's the cost. So in DB over here with a RIP, our metric is HOP, which is a very simple, dumb metric really. EIGRP, by the way, is no longer a Cisco proprietary protocol. It is now an open protocol, but it is bandwidth plus the sum of the delay. So it's the slowest bandwidth plus the sum of the delays in the, uh, in the path. For OSPF, the item is cost, and cost is based upon the link speed and your reference bandwidth. Uh, which we'll talk about here shortly. So link state versus distance vector um, is made up of these items for the most part. Questions about those? Anybody want to add anything to these two tables? Mm -hmm. I, I apologize for my handwriting, folks. I'm left-handed. I've also been hit by a truck. 
So I'm pretty much, you know, my handwriting's going to be horrible. Anybody want to add anything that they use for these? Okay. So let's look at OSPF. It's fundamentals. It is a non-proprietary interior gateway routing protocol. Um, I did not mention IGP versus AG, uh, EGP, but um, there is a thing called autonomous system, which is a group of routers under the control of a single organization, typically running the same IGP or interior gateway protocol. Um, and then the EGP, our exterior gateway protocols, the only one we currently use still is BGP, um, is routing between autonomous systems. There are two different versions in play today, basically OSPF version two and OSPF version three. OSPF version three supports both IPv4 and IPv6. OSPF version two only supports IPv4. Now, when a an OSPF router boots up, one of the things it's gonna do is it's gonna look at all the links that it is attached to and their state. It will then send link state advertisements. So DDBs or uh, type two uh, database descriptor packets. Um, and they'll send those out to all, they'll flood it out to the entire network. So instead of just sending it to their neighbors the way that distance vector routing protocols do, OSPF sends it to everybody. Then everyone takes that information and takes the uh, Dijkstra Shortest Path First algorithm and develops using cost, again, associated with the speed of the link and the reference bandwidth that you've applied uh, to your OSPF configuration, and will then develop a Shortest Path First tree. Once those uh, topologies are built, you will notice that all of the local router will always be at the top of the tree because they're building that tree from their perspective. OSPF does have the ability to have bounded areas. You must always have an area zero, okay? That area zero is called the backbone. And by definition, all other areas must have a connection, direct connection to the backbone. Now we're gonna learn about virtual links. They don't really talk about it. They talk about it a little bit in the class, but they don't really show you a whole lot about it. There is a thing called a virtual link to where we could actually have an area 56 out here off of R4, not connected to area zero. And we could create a virtual link through area 34 to make area 56 think it's connected to the backbone. Um, it's not a preferred method uh, as far as a way to do OSPF, but it is something we can do if we need to do it. The good news about multi-area OSPF is that um, some updates like type ones, type two LSAs are bounded within a single area and will not pass to other areas. So links flapping in area 12 will not necessarily affect area zero or area 34 that will be kept within area 12. So as networks expand, we can control the, the link state database size and the way it works. Here are our five of our um, inter-router communication packet types. Um, by the way, one of the things we will notice is that with both EIGRP and OSPF, they make a point that the protocol number for EIGRP is 88 and the protocol number for OSPF is 89. The multicast address for EIGRP is 9 and 10, 224.009 and 0010, I think 009. And then for OSPF, it's 224.005 for all routers. And then uh, not that by all routers, that means all routers running OSPF. That does not mean all routers. That just means all routers running OSPF. Okay. And 224. Dot zero dot zero dot six are all DR routers. So that would be your DRs and BDRs in our multi-access networks. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But type one LSAs are hello packets. So that is used, excuse me, type one packets, not LSAs, but type ones are used to send and um, maintain neighbor relationships. Database descriptors are type twos, DD, DBDs and DDPs. So that's a OSPF type two packet. And OSPF type three is a link state request. In other words, 
uh, tell me about this particular link. And then the router will respond with a type four, a link state update. And then the router that sent the LSR should send an LS, uh, a type five or an ACK saying, I received that information. Um, these are OSPF types, not necessarily the LSA type. So this is OSPF packet types. Don't get confused by that because it is easy to confuse it. So here's our hello packets. When we send out a hello packet, it has the router ID. Let's talk a second about router ID. So let me back up here, create me a new whiteboard. So OSPF router ID. Number one, it can be set with the router ID, right? If you set it with the router ID command that overrides everything else, no matter, nothing else matters. It's not going to um, pick up any other IP address for the IP for the router ID. It is, by the way, router ID, even in uh, OSPF version three using um, IPv6, it is a 32-bit number, okay? If you don't set the router ID, what's the next item that will be picked as the router ID in OSPF? Loopback. Highest loopback, okay? Key point is the highest loopback, because if you have multiples, it's mm -hmm. the highest one. Okay, and then if there's no loopback set, what's the next one? Highest address of your physical interfaces? Yep, highest physical. Yep, highest physical active. That's a good point. Physical active. Active. Ooh, hold on a minute. That was terrible, y'all. Like I had a spasm. Highest physical active IP address. What happens if you have no router ID set and no IP address is set on your router and you try to turn on OSPF? Anybody ever tried that? It'll actually give you a warning message. It'll actually um, say, can't do it. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say, I know I've seen it in OSPF version three. Yeah, it won't it'll, let you um, move forward with the process. It'll tell you if you try it. So if I go in here and this thing's gonna boot up, and yeah, I know I'm using packet tracer, but it's quick. I said it was quick. Well, you can hit the fast forward button, right? That, uh, yeah, I could. No, I don't. Uh. Right here to the very left. Oh, it's too late now. To yeah, the left. Late. Yeah, it's too late now, but I got it. Yeah, you're right, I could have. All right, so let's do en config t router ospf reason OSPF and my hands do not want to work. It, it can't start the process. So it cannot start the process because it can't associate with at least one up IP interface. In other words, it can't have an it can't do hello packets because it has no IP address to use in that router ID field. So be aware the router ID has to be set in some way before OSPF will actually start up. There are inside of these particular hello packets, you will have your authentication options if you use authentication. So OSPF does support MD5 authentication on links. So you can set, um, and rightfully you need to set um, authentication between your OSPF, excuse me, routers. The area ID is in your hello packets. The interface address, the interface priority for DR election, the hello interval, the time in seconds, the dead interval, which is typically four times the hello, um, the DR, BDR, and the active uh, neighbor list, if you have any. True, false. Uh, OSPF routers can have different hello intervals. And still establish a neighbor relationship. I guess I should put that in there. Not on the same link. Exactly, David. They cannot have different hello intervals and establish a neighbor relationship. OSPF hello intervals must match. EIGRP will actually negotiate to the lowest uh, hello interval, but OSPF will not. OSPF will say, yeah, not going to happen. 
So when we start uh, connecting routers together with OSPF, they're gonna be in one of these states. As they move through these states, they're moving into the full state, which means they're fully adjacent and able to talk to each other. But down, there's no OSPF hello packets have been received. Um, no information has been received, but it's still attempting. Init means I have received a hello packet from another router, but we haven't established bi-directional communication. In other words, I may have received your hello, but I haven't received an ACK uh, or another hello, uh, vice versa. So the two sides haven't seen each other. If you are able to establish two-way, then you have bi-directional communi communication. And that's when BDR and DR election occurs. It has to occur. Now remember, DRs and BDRs are only used on multi-access broadcast capable networks. So Ethernet is typically where we're going to see those. About the only place we're going to see them. Um, X start your former adjacency. Your synchronizing uh, router and masters will be a master slave for the LSDB synchronization. Then you start exchanging your database descriptor packets loading so lsrs are sent for anything that you don't have uh lsas for or link state information for and then finally you will go to the full state and that is when you have a full neighbor relationship sometimes you'll see stuck in a knit or you'll see a router that never moves past a knit this is typically because you've got one-way communication on a link for whatever reason, you don't have bi-directional communication. So if you ever hear stuck in a knit, um, that is typically because the link is not bi-directional communication enabled. All right, so OSPF does um, require that every router establish a, a neighbor adjacency with every other router. That becomes a major issue on broadcast networks because the routers end up having to establish a large number of relationships as you add more routers to a network. To fix this on multi-access networks, OSPF uses a concept called a DR or a designated router. The routers in the topology only have to form an adjacency with the DR and the BDR. They don't establish adjacencies with each other. And then the DR and BDR establish the adjacencies with everyone so that they're able to um, see every other router. The routers in a network will send information to the designated router, and then the designated router will then flood it out to everyone else. So the DR and the BDR have full adjacencies. Everyone else just has an adjacency to the DR and BDR. That is to simplify the adjacency table and the neighbor table. Configuration is very simple. Router OSPF process ID. And by the way, this ID does not have to match on every router. It is just a place for the OSPF process to be associated with. So just like you go, if you go into uh, task manager and you see the process ID on a, uh, oh, poop, I'll probably won't be able to find it now. But the process ID on a process um, the big thing here is that's exactly the same with OSPF. You've got the uh, process ID. So, and I've got to close that. So, it does not have to match. It's not like a, a EIGRP where the autonomous system number has to match. It does not have to match. Then you have your network statements, and we can do these in a multitude of ways. We can do a, an individual interface. So we can do a zero, 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 zero mask. We can do a statement that matches the actual network. Or if we're really, really lazy, the easiest way to do it is to make the, the following network statement to simply say, okay, I'm going to do network, oops, network, zero, 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 zero. 255, 255, 255, 255, area, whatever, area X, area zero, whatever. And then this will say that every single network that is on a router will be put into that OSPF area. So that's one way to do it. 
You can do it to match a particular network, 192.168.12.0, 000.255, area zero or whatever. You can do an interface. So 192.168.12.1000000 area zero. And that will put that particular interface into a an OSPF area. So those are all ways of doing the network statement. Question about those. Now, by the way, that would be under router, config-router. So it'd be under our global OSPF configuration. What's the other way we can do OSPF configuration? Anybody remember? Under the um, interface, correct? Uh, correct. Under the actual interface itself. You can actually go in on the interface and you can provide, um, put that interface into an area. So IP OSPF 1, area 0 would put that particular area in, or that particular interface into area zero. Cool. We also can set our router IDs and passive interfaces. Sometimes we are connected to networks that do not have other OSPF routers on them. So we don't need to be sending out OSPF hello packets on it. Uh, we can set those. Typically any interface that on a router that only has hosts on it, we would want to set it to be passive so that it does not have, um, does not send out OSPF hello packets every 10 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever um, is associated with that interface. Requirements for an adjacency, you must have a unique router ID. You must have a common subnet. You must have a common MTU that must match. The area ID must match. If appropriate, the DR must be uh, set for that segment. Hello and dead timers must match. Authentication type must match. And then if we are using multiple areas, then the type must match. So if it's a stubby, not so stubby, or totally stubby area, those type flags must match. And that's really beyond the, uh, the scope of this class, but that's something we'll learn in the next class. So here we have area zero. So basic OSPF configuration. Um, they all are part of the same subnet. They all have the same MTU. They will make a uh, DR election. Now, assuming, let's look here. Assuming nothing has changed and the router IDs, we don't know what the area zero IDs are, but given the IDs we have, well, you can't make that, you can't make a decision. Why can I not make a decision about who would be the designated router on area zero as far as well, I can't actually because area zero. Nope, I can't. Why can't I make an assumption about the DR for the 10.123.4.0 network? Does anybody know? You mean just looking at the topology? Yep. Um, well, you don't have the actual interfaces for those net, the IP addresses for those interfaces. Right. Um, that's one. And then, well, I guess if you, if the party is going to all be the same. And one thing here, let's take this and let, well, I keep clicking the wrong thing. Let me grab this. Let's grab a snipping tool here and let's pull this out. Edit copy. Let me go over here. Back up. Let's do a different one. And we got, I think David's chatting here. Oh, that's okay. Let's pop this in here. Pop this image in. All right. So what we actually have here is we have multiple broadcast areas, right? We have right here, R1 will be the DR for that because that's, there's, you know, there's a D, there's only one DR here. All right. And we probably set those to be uh, passive, right? It's going to be the DR here, not BDR, DR. DR here will be R4 because every one of these broadcast networks would have a DR elected. But right here on this network, We can't really make a decision because we don't know the IP addresses here, 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 and here. Okay. Because, you know, we can assume, we can make an assumption that if this was the router ID of R4, then yes, it would be the DR for area zero. But also one of the things we have to consider is which router booted first. Because you remember 
in our lab that we did, you have to clear the IPOSPF process when you change the priority to make a particular router a uh, DR, BDR. By default, what's the priority on all these interfaces for IPOSPF priority? So I want to one, say 100. I I, or I one, I have, I got costs. Yep, it's one, so it's one. <laughs> yeah. So unless we change that priority on the interface and not knowing anything else, I would say that R4 would be the DR and R3 would be the BDR. But it's hard for me to say that because I don't know what IP addresses they have on the 4.0 network, okay? So that's why I mentioned that and make that point as to that's difficult to say here, okay? Um, scroll on down here. Let's move on down a little bit. So verification of OSPF routes show IP OSPF. Uh, that will show your OSPF routes. Okay. Uh, what what is this 110, folks? What is that number right there? What does 110 stand for? The default administrative distance. That's the administrative distance. So that is what I call the trustworthiness of a route. So 110 is higher or lower, better on the administrative distance. You said, is it? Is higher well, or lower better? Oh, it's going to always be lower. So the lower the number, the more trustworthiness the route is. Correct. So connected has a value of zero because it doesn't get any better than that. Static is one, and then it moves up from there. What is this second item here in the brackets? The metric. The metric, correct. Now, one thing I will mention to you in our lab that we do for this particular section, we'll start looking at metrics. Be aware, the lab document shows the metric will be 20, but because we're actually using gigabit links, the metric will be two, not, not 20. So if you saw that discrepancy when you did the lab on OSPF, that was the reason why it's because our links are gigabit links uh, inside of CML instead of fast ethernet links. Fast ethernet links would have been a 20, uh, but because we're using gigabit, it is a two. Advertising default routes, I call this the magic dust command, but we go to our border router, we put in a static default route and we use default information originate and then all internal routers will get a um, default route injected into their OSPF. It is an E2 route, which means it's an external OSPF route, um, but you can also set the metric if you so choose to do so. Um, but that is how you can propagate a default route into OSPF. Know how to do that because, by the way, this command only goes on the router that has the default route out for your network. It doesn't go anywhere else and it will then propagate from that route. By the way, that would mean that R2 would have a default route going to R1. R3 here would have a default route going to R2 because it, it builds that default route um, from inside out. Some common optimizations here, obviously, is our reference bandwidth. If we use the default reference bandwidth, then fast, Ethernet, gigabit, and 10 gig all appear to be the same cost of one. That is bad. So we change that. We actually change it to a higher number, to 1,000, so that a uh, gigabit link, uh, excuse me, fast Ethernet is 10, and then gigabit is one, and 10 gigabit is one or we can change it to even higher so that a 10 gigabit has a one uh, fast ethernet that's 100 and gigabit would be 10. So the big thing here is this, make absolutely sure that when you make this change, you change it on every router in your entire OSPF network. If you don't, you can really get some weird routing decisions being made because cost is our metric. So, OSPF sends hello packets at default intervals. Uh, when the dead interval, uh, if you don't receive a hello packet during the dead interval, the router will actually remove that neighbor from its state and see it as down. You can change that particular hello timer if you so choose. Um, just remember you need to set it to the same uh, hello and dead on all your routers in your environment if you make those changes. It's always funny, we tell you how to do this and then typically Cisco says, don't change this unless we absolutely tell you to change it. Um, but it is possible. And one of the common troubleshooting is, is to look at the hello timers and see that they are different on two routers. And that's why they're not forming a neighbor adjacency or relationship. 
priority is any number between one and 255. One is the default. If you set a priority to zero, that means a router will never become a DR. It will still show as a druther when you do uh, show IP OSPF a neighbor, which is weird. Um, but if it says priority zero, it will not become a DR. Also realize that the election takes place as routers come online. So if a router is already online and it is a DR, it will not give up its DR status to a router that has a higher router ID or even a higher priority. So um, be aware that you need to um, clear the processes once you make those changes or set your priority the way you want it to be on the interfaces. Then bring up the routers in the order that you wish for the DR to be brought up first then your BDR, and then any other routers that will participate in your OSPF network. So again, here we have setting our priority. So G01 has got a priority of one, uh, and then uh, G01 and R4 has priority of zero. It'll always be a druther. It's never, ever gonna become a DR, BDR. Um, so that, and then if you brought up R1 first, R1 would be the DR, and then uh, depending on the priority set on R3 and R2, one of these two would become a BDR. However, R4 with a priority of zero would never become a BDR. You basically are saying that router cannot be the BDR. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, different types of networks. On broadcast networks, we have a hello of 10, a weight of 40, a dead of 40. On non-broadcast like frame relay and sub-interfaces, we have a hello of 30, a weight of 120, which is four times. It's always four times. I think I said three times, sorry, four times the hello interval. Point to point does not do DR or BDR but it's 10 and 40 and point to multi-point is 30 and 120. So basically remember for broadcast and point to point, it's 10 and 40. For non-broadcast and point to multi-point, it is 30 and 120 for our timers. Default timers. So a broadcast network is any network that's capable of connecting more than two devices. You must have a DDR there. A point-to-point -point is only two devices, so you don't need a, a, a DR. You don't need it at all. And then loopback is, uh, you can lose loopback for many different things. Um, you know, you can set loopback so that you can use a slash 32 prefix. Um, and if you do it as a loopback network, if you put that in as the type, it will use a 32 prefix, even if you've got a different IP address on that um, interface, on that loopback. So just know if you set it as a loopback, it's going to always advertise a slash 32 prefix, regardless of what prefix you put on that interface. All right. Any questions about OSPF? Here we have again key terms. Notice again that we are looking at how to initiate the process, how to do our network statements, enabling it on an interface passive interface ID. Now this is, remember this is in uh, under config dash router mode. Both of these are. Reference bandwidth in megabits per second. Our cost, we can actually set the cost of a link if we so choose. Um, that, that way you can control the route that a packet would take. Priority for our DR and BDR election and then our types of networks. So we can do broadcast point to point and we can do loopback. So don't forget that. And then clear IP OSPF process. A key thing I wanna tell you about in the real world, you do this and your routers will quit routing until they reestablish the OSPF process. So this does disrupt your data traffic. So in the real world, be very careful issuing this particular command on a live network. Any questions on OSPF? Nope. All right. Again, I just want to bring to your uh, bring your attention uh, in this particular lab right here. 
one of the things I will bring your attention is um, down. Let's see, was it this one or is it the other one? Right here. Um, right here, when we set this reference bandwidth to 1000, uh, because we're using gigabit links instead of, if you look at the lab, the lab actually assumes fast ethernet links here, but in CML, we're using gigabit. So if you see, um, if you see instead of 20, if you see two right here, that is correct behavior because we're using gigabit links. All right. So just be aware of that when you're working on this lab. All right, folks, that's all I have for today. Are there any questions about anything we've gone over? Any questions about how to move your, um, your configs now into the lab? And I'm sorry it took me so long to get that done, but we do have the ability to do that now through, uh, through you using Gmail. My reservation ended. So you can use Gmail. I see Jay's in here actually doing a lab. So, but we, we have that available now. So, okay, I'll stop the recording.